guy, Judge Clumber. Well, you can't. I said technically. I just didn't buy it. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. 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 Uh, the first couple of minutes today, uh, my colleague Bei Wang wanted to um, take the opportunity to introduce a class that she will be teaching in the fall uh, about like an advanced data visualization course. So Bei, please go ahead. All right. Uh, so I'm using uh, the first few minutes to advertise for the class. This class is data visualization. This next class is advanced data visualization. Uh, and here's my contact information. It's CS6965. Um, so this is actually a new course. Uh, we are going to uh, hopefully offer it on a yearly basis. Uh, but the idea is that you, you have introductory uh, data visualization courses, but then the whole data visualization is such a vast field. So we want to cover some advanced topics. And specifically for this particular class in the spring, I'm going to focus on what I call large and complex data sets. That include things like point cloud and networks and ensemble data sets. But I'm going to go through each of the major topics quickly. So the whole idea is that um, the, the class is very much centered around a uh, mini project and final project. In the mini project, some of the topic I'm going to have is essentially uh, one is a network visualization, one is visualization of personal data, and visual, uh, topological summarization with TTK, which is a particular toolkit. And finally is uh, uh, try to combine machine learning with visualization. Okay. And the prerequisite of the class is that there's no formal prerequisite. However, the students are expected to have basic knowledge of data structure and algorithm. And given that you already take data visualization in this course, so you're probably very qualified for taking the advanced course already. Um, the idea is that you need to have some working on knowledge of programming, uh, ideally either with Python or with uh, C and C++. Uh, the target audience are PhD student, master's student, or very motivated uh, upper level undergrad students. If you are not sure whether you, uh, you are qualified to take this class, let me know. But since you are sitting in data visualization, I assume you are qualified. OK? Um, you are also not required to be major in CS, but you do need to have background in algorithms or data science related courses. Again, if you're not sure, email me. So um, the goal is really uh, to, to talk about new research, uh, to talk about new techniques in the field, and you can pursue new research direction in data analysis and data visualization, and you can also apply some of the what I call emerging and innovative techniques to data in various application domains. Okay. Uh, the, the four main topics I'm going to cover in this advanced course, number one is high dimensional data, uh, combining machine learning with visualization. Second topic is how to visualize large graphs or networks. Uh, the third one is using what we call topological abstraction. And last one is what I call personalized visualization. So the first topic uh, is essentially um, high dimensional data set arise in many applications, including scientific application as well as business, where you can think about data coming from hospital, coming from marketing, also coming from uh, uh, dynamic sim uh, uh, scientific simulations. They are all high dimensional point cloud. And the whole idea is really how can we combine high dimensional data analysis, for example, in this case, dimension reduction, uh, with interactive visualization. So the idea would be that we are applying machine learning to those high dimensional data sets, but the, but the key idea is you can use visualization to help you better understand your high dimensional data. So the ultimate product is to combine machine learning techniques with visualization techniques. Because from my perspective, uh, if that is sort of a very key component to start a high dimensional. Uh, point cloud data, right? So you cannot really study it without having a very intuitive visualization, especially interactive visualization. So that's the first goal. So the goal is to obtain insights from high dimensional data through machine learning and interactive visualization. Second topic is analysis and visualization of large graphs and networks. I'm giving an example on the right where this is a visualization of very large networks, large in the sense that you can only see roughly, the visualization only shows you my data is complex. But in this, this visualization has an issue because the top network is actually a binary tree where every node has a degree two. The bottom one have a very high degree node, has a, a thousand degree nodes. So in some sense that you need to def not only just try to visualize network data or graph data, you need to actually extract features from them in order to highlight what is contained instead of those naive visualization, which just show you that my data is complex. Um, some of the motivational data we are going to deal with is things like brain network and social networks. 
for example, this is a visualization of a time-varying social networks where we are trying to use advanced techniques, uh, analysis techniques, uh, combined with visualization to try to pick out essentially over a time-varying um, network what are the essential events that happened that corresponding to important event in my social network. Okay, so that's one example of this. So that's the second topic, how do you analyze and visualize networks? The third topic is we're using topology to uh, use it as a summarization techniques. Um, well, I'm not going to go into detail, but essentially think about topology as a way to skeletize your data or obtain a skeleton of your data. And especially when your data is large and you want to understand the complex interaction of different parts of the data, you actually use, you need to use topology to get a global skeleton of the data set. So that's the main idea. And think about it also as a way of compression. And for this particular aspect, we're actually going to not code everything from scratch. We're going to use what we call topology toolkit. So this is a library uh, that is developed under C and C++. Um, but if you know C and C++ or Python, you can build over a wrapper around it. So you can use this library as part of your mini project. So the main idea is we're going to study some of those topological concepts and how it can be used in summarization and compression. And last bit is what I call personalized visualization. I heard this talk, very inspiring talk. This is a visualization of personal data. This is actually the data coming from a musician. And then they're they, they trying to visualize how this musician actually plays a guitar, like his way of his finger movement. This is a visualization of how a particular song is played. Okay, so when I say personalized visualization, it has several aspects. Is that the visualization is targeted towards a particular user, or your data is coming from sort of a different type of personal data set. This is another example where this is actually every cluster is a bunch of consumers. I'm visualizing the entire consumer space of people's purchasing behavior. Okay, so that's another example of what I call personalized visualization. So overall, it's going to be very exciting. It's going to be high level, uh, higher level classes in computer science. And but if you like data visualization, I would highly recommend you take this class. We're going to have a lot of fun. So if you have any question, just email me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. Oh, this is we stopped um, talking about text visualization, uh, but before we get back into that, uh, any administrative things, any questions about projects or anything like that? Um, remember that like, um, we have another reading for Thursday, um, and so actually I put in on two readings, but I, I would rather have you read the Tamara Manson paper with the design. Um, with the um, nested model for designing visualizations. Um, I'll put an announcement on Slack. Um, and this paper, the nested model paper, and the one that we read for today, um, the storytelling paper are going to be on the test for grad students. Um, OK, so let's do a quick recap. What did we talk about when we talked about text visualization last time? Uh, we kind of like um, talked about, like well, we talked about set visualization and text visualization. Um, but then uh, we, we kind of used um, text um, as kind of like, um, there's, there's different ways of, um, of, of thinking about text. So there's the, the level of um, typo typography, uh, there's the level of visualizing raw text with, with text highlighting, um, and then we um, mostly talked about extracting some kind of features uh, from text using some like very, very basic NLP methods. Um, and then using those methods to visualize something higher level about the test. Uh, uh, some things as easy as stop word removal, sentence splitting, changing to lowercase, noun chunking, and so on. Um, and, and even those simple um, aspects, we can use them to um, actually uh, extract some meaningful structure out of text. Um, and then this is like a chart that illustrates um, the different um, levels of detail that we can look at text for text visualization from the letter um, to over like a sentence, paragraph, up to um, documents, document clusters, and then big corpora um, that we can all study together. And one of the text visualizations we talked about was the Wordle. Um, and the Wordle is essentially a frequency based and it's kind of like an, um, a kind of an attractive visualization of a text. It's kind of simple to create. You just paste um, uh, 
uh, a text into um, into a website, and then you would create a, a word like this, and it gives you kind of like a quick summarizations of what are the most um, important terms. And then modern Wordle implementations do have um, some like design um, restrictions or design features that you can use to like create for something like um, the figure of Lincoln here. Uh, and this is approximately where we start. Um, this is a word tree visualization, and the idea of the word tree visualization is to use like a
And for today's lecture, that would be storytelling. So, um, I want to start this off with just playing a five minute data story and then discussing what is going on in this data story. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head on Americans, how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was. Nine out of ten of them said it should be more like this than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution of this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution. Shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart. But the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than 9 out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind-blowing. But let's look at it another way, because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. Teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now, let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So, here's that ideal we asked everyone about. Something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor since the poverty line stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30 percent are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly 100 times that of the poorest Americans, and about 10 times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10 percent are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5 percent are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1 percent, this guy, well, his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own, because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, 8 out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, 
only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1% take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976, they took home only 9%, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money, but do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee? N not his lowest paid employee, not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. Okay, so what do you think? Well done. So, okay, let's take this apart a little bit. Um, how, how is data used here? Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but like more specifically, is it, is it extremely specific about like the data sources? Does it give you exact values? So one very effective thing that they did, which is a good approach to storytelling, is they essentially broke it down and make it personable by taking it away from the initial chart where they just talked about proportions and breaking it down into this like one person representing this like percentile of the population, right? So that we we kind of have a natural way of thinking about if we think about like I'm one of a hundred in a group of a hundred, we can understand that quite well. We're not as good as saying like the top one percent. Like, am I in the top 1%? I don't know. Am I the richest man in the group of 100? That's something that is a little bit more tangible. Um, so, what else was um, striking me about this? Transitions. Transitions. So, yes. There were a lot of very smooth transitions, and they were all well done. Um, and also, there, were, there was quite a bit of animation, right? Um, and what was especially well done? Yeah. It's, it was a, like a small story. The yes, it was, and we will be talking mostly about these stories that we direct to the general public in this lecture now. Uh, so it's really meant to inform everybody. Um, how, like, what was the role of narration versus visualization? The narration just supported the visualization. And yeah. And how, how did, was this like very closely linked or was it like loosely linked? Yeah, I think it was very closely linked, right? Every time he mentioned, like he said a word, um, this, like there was an animation going on showing this particular uh, group of people that corresponds to. Also the narration served the purpose of connecting all the faces. Exactly. The, uh, the narration did really well in smoothing over the transitions between the different parts. Um, did, was this a neutral presentation? So how can you tell that this wasn't neutral? Well, the connotation was uh, pretty evident against the rich people and then the one person that this is something immensely wrong with the system. The way yeah, but is that, that, that is data, right? Um, that is neutral somehow, like the fact that, that we have the facts this, this data is correct, um, so the chart itself isn't really biased. No, I mean, because if it was neutral, we would just give it, uh, the control is in the hands of the user. But here, the narrator is kind of defining the main aspects of the visualization. And so data. are you saying that every time I narrate a story, it can't be neutral? You can be, but then here there's a different bias, which is and the way he's summarizing the end. Like, this is what it is, and this is where Okay, so the, the, the conclusion that he draws, that is clearly not neutral. Any other aspects that... Yes. I'd say from his voice, the tone of how he describes the data, and then even to the extent of the background music, how it's so somber, it would also yes. be a bias. 
And then he said, the dreaded socialism, in a very sarcastic <laughs> tone, right? right. Uh, so you could clearly see the biases, and there were a lot of little things like the limousine dropping off the wealthiest person there, uh, and so the, lots of little things like this. Um, and so this is clearly um, a well done um, interactive or animated data visualization, but it of course clearly has an agenda. Uh, and that's not necessarily bad or good, um, but now we'll take this apart in like a more structured way. Um, let's take a step back. What is storytelling itself? I, storytelling is sometimes referred to as the world's second oldest profession, um, because we have always told stories. Like well, even before we had writing or data visualization in any form, we, we essentially used words to pass on stories. And so. Um, the typical story like, has a structure like this. We have an introduction, uh, then we set up a problem, we come to some kind of climax, so Frodo is throwing the ring into Mount Doom, um, and then we have a resolution and conclusion. Uh, and of course this is not exactly to be followed in data stories, uh, because very often we, it, we don't want to just tell an entertaining or um, engaging story, but we also want to inform, right? But you can also think about this structure if you want to create an engaging uh, story. And so, um, good stories uh, do more than just provide facts and data. They situate something in its larger environment. They give context. They engage. They make it interesting to watch. Like, how often do you shut off a YouTube video, right? Like, because it's uninteresting. This last one that I just showed, clearly, I think most people will watch this to the end. Um, and they are also supposed to educate. Um, and you, this, these are kind of like journalistic principles, like what makes a good data story, you have to answer these questions, like who, what, where, when, why, and how. Um, so this is like very general, um, applies to any kind of storytelling. Um, now why do we want to do storytelling with data or with visualization? Because you want to be like underscore arguments you have with data or facts. And you also want to leverage the power of visualization. Um, we've learned like we can show trends, we can show correlations, we can show outliers, and we can easily convey magnitudes in ways that words or text simply cannot. Uh, and so I'm going to show another short clip uh, that is really good at showing correlation and outliers and magnitudes. Um, this is from uh, An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore. What's going on now, there's just no comparison. So if you look at a thousand years worth of temperature, and compare it to a thousand years of CO2, you can see how closely they fit together. Now, a thousand years of uh, CO2 in the mountain glaciers, that's one thing. But in Antarctica, they can go back 650,000 years. <coughs> this incidentally uh, is the first time anybody outside of a small group of scientists has seen this image. This is the present day uh, era, and that's the last ice age. Then it goes up. That, we're going back in time now, 650,000 years. That's a period of warming between the last two ice ages. That's the second and third ice age back, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh ice age back. Now, an important point. In all of this time, 650,000 years, the CO2 level has never gone above 300 parts per million. Now, as I said, they can also measure temperature. Here's what the temperature has been on our Earth. Now, one thing that kind of jumps out at you is, well, let me put it this way. If my classmate from the sixth grade that talked about uh, African South America were here, he would say, did they ever fit together? <laughs> Most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But they did, of course. And the, the relationship is actually very complicated, but there is one relationship that is far more powerful than all the others, and it is this. When there is more carbon dioxide, the temperature gets warmer because it traps more heat from the sun inside. In the parts of the United States that contain the modern cities of Cleveland, Detroit, New York, in the northern tier, this is the difference between a nice day and having a mile of ice over your head. Keep that in mind when you look at this fact. 
carbon dioxide having never gone above 300 parts per million, here is where CO2 is now. Way above where it's ever been as far back as this record will measure. Now, if you'll bear with me, I want to really emphasize this point. I, the, the crew here has tried to teach me how to use this contraption here, so if I don't kill myself, I'll... <coughs> it's already right here. Look how far above the natural cycle this is, and we've done that. But ladies and gentlemen, in the next 50 years, really in less than 50 years, it's going to continue to go up. When some of these children who are here are my age, here's what it's going to be in less than 50 years. You've heard of off the charts. Within less than 50 years, it'll be here. There's not a single fact or date or number that's been used to make this up that's in any controversy. The so-called skeptics look at this and they say, so, that seems perfectly okay. <laughs> well, again, if on the temperature side, if, if this much on the cold side is a mile of ice over our heads, what would that much on the warm side be? Ultimately, this is really not a political issue so much as a, a moral issue. If we allow that to happen, it is... Okay, so again... There was an agenda behind the story, right? Um, but it also very clearly shows uh, what data visualization can do here. Like we have this, these, these um, trends tracking each other very closely. And you can tell that to somebody, but it's, it, make, it makes a much more lasting impression if you show this correlation in a visualization and if you tell people what it means. And of course, if you show an outlier like this and even have a little crane to emphasize your point, um, you, you can really show very, very well that something is different in, in your data set. Um, so um, I kind of want to take apart like, this story that they uh, talked about and this data story that they talked about in this particular paper here to kind of give you an overview. Like we've talked about, these are kind of videos, but like, we've, uh, there's a couple of different types of, of data stories, obviously. The videos are one thing, uh, but then we can also have these like magazine style, or uh, in this case, well, the, these printed uh, data visualizations, um, these like science poster-like data visualizations. Um, and so this is a good visualization of um, this person's um, Barry, Bond, uh, Barry Bond's home, home run record in baseball. And so the, the article essentially is telling people that um, he was on track to be a good hitter of home runs over his career, but then there were some allegations that he took steroids at some point. And so this is kind of what this visualization explores. Um, and so what does it start with? It gives us something like an anchor, an introduction. Um, it starts with 755, like the number of home runs that this guy has, um, has hit. And then we have a title. And then we have a subtitle. So that kind of like gives us, this is what this visualization is about, right? Um, then we have some context and some legend here. So we compare this particular person to Babe Ruth and Barry Bonds, two other famous uh, hitters in baseball. Um, and so um, Hank, uh, Hank Aaron, Barry Bo uh, Babe Ruth, and Barry Bonds. Like um, Barry Bonds is, is the one in red, the one that we care about most. most. Um, and so we see Babe Ruth in gray and Hank Aaron in black. So we have a clear legend here, and we have pictures of those people. Um, so they make it relatable. Um, and then we have the main story. And the main story is like the progression of career home runs um, in, on this line chart here. And so we can see that um, essentially Babe Ruth had a slower start, but otherwise those three had largely the same trajectory. But then there is a call out, kind of like the main point of this chart. And like, they use annotation to make a key point, a change in trends. 
the time when um, Barry Bonds like, has supposedly started taking steroids, the hit rate for him massively increased, and then within two years he has overtaken um, Hank Aaron here. Um, so, and this is very well illustrated because we have this, this time frame here is highlighted and then we have contextual information um, about this. So next, um, they give us um, some context using matching on content. So the matching is like, essentially they use the same colors and the same kind of chart uh, to show us like, a specific sub part of this chart in detail. So this is for um, high, like at the end of their career between 34 and 40. Um, and that kind of like illustrates again their main point, which was around here. Um, so that gives us uh, context, uh, but it also uses a like the matching technique by using the same visual variables, the same uh, channels and the same marks uh, so that we keep with, that we are oriented. And then, as in many good uh, data stories, um, there is also multi-messaging. So now we would have only this one thing, but we don't know anything about how are these comparing to everybody else. Is this like a significant outlier or something like this? And so they come up with this, these two charts here um, where they visualize other players that are currently on track to kind of like get into this elite league of, of good hitters. And then um, there are different paths of um, players that hit a lot of home runs. Um, and here they actually don't use the same visual encodings, but they switch to bar charts. Um, and why do you think they switch to bar charts here? It's hard, to, like, it's hard to read for you guys, so I'm just going to tell you. The idea being that by the, using the bar charts, you can see the uh, record in every season more clearly. Um, and so you can see essentially um, how people like, were out of constant, or whether they had like, uh, probably an injury-related uh, uh, gap in here, or anything like that, which would be harder to see in line charts. So this visualizes, if you can, th you can think about it, like change of this line chart, or simply the home runs per season. Um, so, and this is like a, a classical um, data story, a visualization story that uses like many of these annotation points. And it's just like the one point that I also want to emphasize is the use of annotation. There, there are so many uh, highlights on here that, that um, point to interesting points. And so, um, Segel and Hare here take this uh, apart into these different genres of data stories. And so, what we were looking at here is um, essentially the partition poster type. Um, so we had like uh, one main point, a couple of side panels, and so on. And then there's other styles, like the magazine style, where essentially we have a lot of text and then a figure, a lot of text again, and then a figure, or just an annotated chart, or a flow chart, or a comic strip, a slideshow, and the film, video, animation category. And so the flow chart and the comic strip, they are kind of well, I think flowcharts are kind of like natural for some things, but for general stories, I think that the annotated chart, magazine style, petition poster, slideshow, and video animations are kind of the most important categories of data stories that are out there. And it's also like frequency-wise, these are the most frequent ones that they found in their meta-analysis. Um, and of course, we've seen like two videos now, uh, and so we'll look at a couple of others uh, for the rest of this class. Um, and I think this is a very important distinction here. Um, who is driving a data story? Is it the author um, or is it the reader? Uh, if it's an author-driven data story, we have linear order ordering, heavy messaging, and no interactivity. Like both of those videos fall exactly in this category, right? You didn't have a choice. You looked at the sequential presentation, uh, there was a lot of messaging, there was no interactivity. Um, the story here, like for uh, um, the baseball story here, is um, still like you can't reveal details about something that you can't see because it's in print. Um, but you can kind of like choose the order. You can choose to on what to focus. So it is li a little bit more reader driven. Um, and then we have uh, a visualization such as this here that is essentially completely reader driven. So this is like a visualization of path to the White House of uh, the Obama versus Romney a couple of weeks before the election. Um, and um, they essentially um, show, give you um, like agency of picking um, if, let's say, Obama were to win North Carolina. Um, then it shows you the path that the different candidates have to the White House. And so here, you're completely in control. 
Um, it's not, you can completely choose everything by yourself. You're kind of coming up with your own story. So you can say like, okay, if Virginia is won by Romney, then Romney has 58 ways to win. And so they're creating these dynamic annotations that they can create out of the data, out of like pre-calculating here every possible option. And then you can explore it and have complete agency. Of course, because I have so much agency and because I can do so much on my own, it's less tailored, right? There's less specific things in um, this visualization that um, somebody wants to tell us. Um, and then uh, Siegel and Hare also found these like types of stories um, that, like, that are along this author or reader driven spectrum and the one very interesting one is this martini glass structure uh, where you start out with an author driven story but then open it up for exploration. So you give some storylines, some heavy annotations, but then dump people into a data visualization where they can actually explore it for themselves. Um, and so this is um, an, an visualization of this type uh, of US gun death uh, in 2013. Um, so it starts out with essentially providing an introduction. So this is the, like one person at 29, he died here. Uh, could have lived to 89. Then we have another person died at 20, could have lived to 84, and so on. And so this kind of like sets the stage. And now it shows all the data uh, of all the gun death in 2013. And so we see how this is populated, how many li li life years are lost. And so at this point, it's still on autopilot, right? So we're kind of like in the stem of the martini class. And once this, this automation, this automated um, thing is over, we can now dig in and explore. We can, like facet, for example, how does this look like for females compared to males or to all other victims? How does this compare for like adults over 30? Is it different in different regions of the uh, country? Um, what happened in the last 30 days and so on. And so here we now can essentially take over and explore the visualization ourselves. Um, the interactive slideshow approach is kind of like more of like multiple martini glasses stacked on top of each other. Like we split it into multiple scenes and allow interaction midway. And so here is a visualization that does this. We have like a stepper interface um, with six different conditions. Um, and then uh, we um, can, like we see some kind of uh, description, President Obama's budget proposal estimates a deficit of 1.6 trillion for the current fiscal year and 1.3 trillion in 2011. Um, then we can go to the next step. Um, then we see the forecasts worsen and then we see past forecasts. Um, but the interesting thing is that we don't have to just follow this narration, but we can actually reveal details about any of those forecasts on demand. So we can kind of like at any point in the story, drop in and do our own thing uh, and explore more about the data. Um, and then, um, in like the third type of story uh, that they found is a drill down story where essentially um, there is no preconceived narration uh, but there is essentially every possible path is annotated and you get a story that you want to uh, that you essentially can like choose completely the path yourself and explore um, this, this, uh, the whole um, data set and so these are different bear markets and of course, this is, this is like very tedious to do for a larger data set. And so they have like about 10 different bear markets, so you can clearly um, do that for this. But um, in general, this is like a hard way of approaching a story, right? Uh, but here, essentially, you make the decision about which uh, period uh, to explore, and you can explore all of these periods with rich annotation. So here are a couple of strategies for um, storytelling. Um, some layout principles. We need to use descriptive titles, descriptive subtitles, annotations, and we can use saturations and other like pre-attentive properties uh, to call things out. So for example, um, here uh, is a, a neutral data visualization that says ice cream flavors preferences based on 2014 survey on elementary school students with an N. That's what we would have in a scientific publication. Or you could say, if you want to tell a data story, chocolate was the most popular flavor among element, uh, elementary student, uh, students surveyed. And you can call out chocolate by essentially increasing the saturation or making it stand out in some other way. Um, 
you can do the same thing here. Um, the project results before and after implementation of a grant. Uh, or project A has the greatest gains after the four year grant funding. So completely neutral, some data interpretation and corresponding highlighting. Um, the, script, uh, the numbers of studies funded each year or we're funding more studies each year. Beginning in 2013, we set aside new funding and so on. And so notice that these points for the years here are removed and only one point um, is, is added and there's annotation added. And so like, that's a strategy to call out points that you care about. Um, of course, interactivity is important in these kinds of stories. And so there's a couple of different types of uh, uh, interactivity and we talked about them, so I'm just gonna give a, like, a brief recap. We have navigation, um, and that in for stories that is, um, for, sto for data stories, that's usually things like steppers or scrolling, scrolling telling, or in videos, play, forward, rewind, and so on. Then we have details on demand, when I can show highlights when desired, as we've just seen earlier. But one very important thing is to make it relevant to the reader. Um, like people care more about local news or news that they associate themselves with than they care about anything else. Um, so if you can ever make it relevant to the reader, uh, ask questions like what do you think, who are you, where do you live, and then kind of tailor your visualization around that, that is a great approach. So here are two visualizations that do that. I'm going to skip over one, just in the interest of some time, but I'm going to show this one here. This is about um, 2015 being the warmest uh, year on record. Um, and this shows me the temperature data for New York City. Um, so I have add the, in red is the actual temperatures. The top here is high, the bottom here is low for each day of the year. And then here in light or in darker gray or darkish, um, dark grayish red, I have the average and then I have other like past maxima and minima in the background. But New York is far away, right? It's like this big city, but I'm not really there. And so how, what they do here is you can put in your own hometown. So you can say Salt Lake City here. Um, and then we can then make this relate to ourselves, right? And that makes it more engaging. So we see uh, like Salt Lake City had a pretty cold uh, May, but then a pretty hot June, but then again, a pretty cold July and August. Uh, but what they also do, what is really nice, they do this for 3,000 cities, but still produce annotations in this uh, chart. They kind of like automatically derive these annotations by pointing out the record highs or tied records and so on. So it's not just data visualization, right? There is some uh, annotation and call outs in there. And there is an even cooler way of engaging people. Um, that is like asking for opinions or prior knowledge. Um, for example, this is a chart or a data visualization that uh, like the series that the New York Times does is you draw it, how family income predicts children college, children's college chances. So here I have the parents' income percentile and here I have the percent of children who attend college. And now I can draw here. What should I draw? What do you think the distribution is? Something like very skewed? So I can kind of like give a prediction. It asks me to finish this up. And then I click I'm done. And now it shows me, oh, my re like the, I kind of like had a less linear uh, relationship uh, in mind than the reality actually is. So it seems to be a pretty linear relationship. Um, but then they also show you how other people think it is. So they kind of like make this story relevant to me, but first asking me about my idea about it, then showing me the real truth, and then showing me the biases of everybody else. Um, and here's another one that is a little bit more intricate. Um, I'm gonna show you one or two. Um, so under, uh, during Obama's presidency, how did the unemployment rate develop? Um, and let's say, we know 2008 wasn't great for uh, employment, so let's say it rose up to uh, uh, 2016. And now show me how I did. And yeah, I did wrong, right? Um, and then I can uh, play like how the number of immigrants convicted of crimes who were deported in the Obama years. Let's say he probably did uh, decrease that. Well, actually not the case. So this is kind of like a really uh, interesting way of engaging people in, uh, in data visualizations. 
um, some design considerations. This is a redesign uh, by um, somebody from Tableau. Uh, this is a visualization of um, car fatalities. Um, and so generally car fatalities have been in the decline, but there is strong seasonal pattern. So people drive more and then more people die um, during the holidays and during the summer. Um, and so this is the original visualization here. And the uh, person from Tableau essentially did not change anything of the primary visual encodings. He only did subtle design changes. So first he took away, like we see, um, these are different years um, for January, February, March, and so on. And so we can see like this peaking around the summer and then the low, uh, the low value is around February. Um, and so this is for multiple years. And so what he did here first is like, take away all of those colors because we know we can't distinguish so many colors so simply show us um, the um, like in uh, one color um, and that is probably saturated by uh, the number of uh, like the, the lowest number of fatalities uh, or by recency one of them it doesn't actually say here and he added an average um, and then he also added annotations um, he calls out there were 4,461 fatalities in August 1980. So that was the highest month on record. Um, and compared to that, there were only 2,522 fatalities in August 2009. So there's 2,000 less. Notice also that this chart here used a zero scale. This chart here doesn't use a zero scale. And I would still argue that it is a better visualization. And here, the color, this color scale is changed. Um, to instead of showing us these shaded colors um, on like a scale from the absolute minimum to the absolute maximum to kind of like have a bimodal scale where we start with red at the median and then we can call out very easily um, the, the days where most people uh, die on the roads uh, in the US and that's around the July 4th weekend, um, January 1st and then around Christmas. Uh, and this is like very evident, very clearly readable. Um, and so on. And so this kind of continues. He rephrased um, the titles and so on, but it's basically the same visualizations, just using a couple of tricks that we talked about in the design lecture to make it much more engaging. And these are kind of like the four uh, principles of design contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity. Um, so, contrast make elements different, uh, making elements different increases understanding. And so we can use contrast in terms of color, or, but of course also to contrast in terms of positioning. Repetition is like we use the similar style, the similar encodings and so on to convey things that are similar. We repeat visual elements to create a star strong unity. Um, we align. So all of those things that um, kind of are of the same type are aligned to each other. Nothing should be placed arbitrarily. Placement illustrates relationships between elements. And then proximity um, is related items should be placed together. So we have a larger gap, for example, between um, two different points on this, um, uh, on this uh, slide than we have between the main point and the sub point. Um, how can we like, um, increase engagement? Well, of course, we want to know our audience. People uh, we don't know are difficult to influence. So we kind of have to think about what do they know, what motivates them, what experiences do you share, what are your common goals, what insights can you give them. Um, and um, so we can kind of like come up with a chart like this where we have um, presentation from neutral to opinionated and low information density to high information density. And so we can say like a board meeting should give you like a very neutral presentation um, of, low, uh, of um, high level information. A group meeting, a research group meeting, is going to be a neutral presentation of very high information density. Like an expert panel, they want to be opinionated because they want to make an engaging story, uh, but they also have high information, pan uh, high information t uh, uh, density. And then if you want to be in public media, like a TED talk, you definitely also want to be opinionated, but you can't convey too much information, you have to make it accessible. And I guess education here is somewhere in the middle. Um, so what would be like a chart like this uh, that shows us market shares for mobile phone platforms somewhere in the 2000s, uh, or because there is, uh, there is still uh, Blackberries here. Um, is this opinionated? No. And it's, is it information rich? Not really, right? What about this, a sales dashboard? 
It's pretty information rich, but doesn't really convey any opinions, right? Um, here we have um, data about um, smoke, the relationship between smoking and cancer. Um, I guess, like, is it opinionated? Yes, you can say yes. It's hard to say, right? Is it political? Probably. Uh, do people have different opinions on it? Yes. Um, and the target audience could be like lay, uh, like lay people that are interested in science or even scientists. Um, what about this chart? Iraq's plot, plot toll. This is a data visualization. It doesn't, it doesn't like come up with anything that is not true. Is it opinionated? Why is it opinionated? <laughs> because of the way it's designed, right? Design can convey strong opinions. Um, so we could also chain, uh, we could also like frame the message quite differently here uh, and say uh, instead of Iraq's blood toll, we could say death on the decline in Iraq. Just flip this around, give it a more neutral color. Now we have a non-opinionated story uh, compared to a very opinionated story. And so if you put this in this chart, uh, we have like this very opinionated low information density, um, uh, opinionated high information density, high information density neutral um, here on this, um, and kind of like situated in this particular chart. So now I want to do an exercise, um, and this is kind of like a take home exercise um, because we don't have enough time, uh, but I want you to analyze three different data stories um, and kind of like try to uh, classify them into these different like um, genres. Is it a magazine annotated chart, petition poster, and so on? Is it author reader driven? Um, does it have a good introduction? And then there are some other things. These are the three charts. Um, uh, please do that uh, now, and then if you can't finish it up, please do it at home. I think it's a valuable exercise uh, for you to do. I think we're done with the video.